thank you for that. Good morning, friends. We're so glad to see everyone here today. Please stand as you're able for our call to worship. We are here to worship a remarkable God. The love of God welcomes us as the grace of Christ enfolds us. We do not come as slaves. We come as the truly free. We do not come as petitioners. We come as those who have already heard. We do not come as outsiders. We come as much wanted children. The love of God enfolds us and the grace of Christ redeems us. We come as the joyful and thankful recipients of the Father's amazing grace. The love of God holds on us, and the grace of Christ liberates us to be truly free. If you'll remain standing, our opening hymn this morning is My Hope is Built. The words are on the screen or on your, in your hymnal on page 368. You might want to get your pens out and take some notes. I have got a lot of announcements today, <laughs> but there won't be a test. First of all, um, the outreach ministry is looking for 10 willing souls to ring bells for the Salvation Army on Saturday, December 16th from 10 to 3. The shifts will be for one hour at a time. If you'd like to ring longer, you can sign up for back-to-back -back shifts. We're going to be ringing at the Kroger in Brentwood Village. And here's the great part. We will be ringing inside where the carts are stored. 
This will be an opportunity to help the Salvation Army get donations. It will also be an opportunity to share Jesus with those coming to shop and those who donate. It will help us to put a face on Grace Methodist with our smiles and blessings to all who stop by. If you're interested and available for that, there is a sign-up sheet out in the hall. And there are still time slots available to be in prayer for one hour on Wednesday, November 1st from 6 a.m. until 6 a.m. November the 2nd. You can sign up for an hour of prayer either at home or here at Grace. Prayer prompts will be made available at the table on Sunday, October 29th. Cindy Gregorich is the one who set this up, but she is out of town. If you have any questions, please speak with Carol Perry. She's helping Cindy with this project. And wouldn't it be great if we could surprise Cindy and have all 24 uh, slots filled? Some of our members have mentioned they are having difficulty hearing well in the sanctuary. If you are someone who would like to have a private listening device during the worship service, please tell an usher at the end of the service or make a note on your attendance sheet. Anchored Kids is off to a great start. We have our largest enrollment ever. Praise God for all these children. We can use more help so that we can give each child the attention they need. No preparation is needed. You'd be assisting the group leaders. The only thing needed is a desire to share God's word and his love with these children. If you'd be willing to help out with this important ministry, please get in touch with Judy Matting. There is one more opportunity with this ministry, and that would be to serve as a prayer warrior. Each of our children have a specific person in our congregation that is praying for them. With our enrollment growing, we need a few more prayer warriors. Each week, the children write out their praises and their prayer requests, and we share those with the prayer warriors so they can keep each child covered in prayer. And this is something that you can do at home. So if you have a desire to help out in that way, please talk with Judy about that. And then the last announcement I have, and you'll want to for sure write this one down. Sunday, November the 5th, the Missions Committee is sponsoring a potluck after the service. They will be providing chili and pulled pork and ask that people that will be attending sign up to either bring a salad or a dessert. And then there again, the sign up sheets are in the hallway. So at this point in our service, it is time for our congregational prayer. We invite you up to the altar or you may stay in your seat and take your concerns to the Lord. Heavenly Father, King Eternal, you have saved me from sin and death for the purpose of living a life that is Christ-like. You found me when I was lost and living apart from the fullness of life that you promised to those who love you. Thank you, O oh God, for putting people in my life who taught me about your love, grace, and mercy. 
Thank you for convicting my heart through the Holy Spirit of the sin in my life. Thank you for the greatest act of sacrificial love, your dear son Jesus dying on the cross. Therefore, I must respond with love to a world who also needs to know you and follow you. God, you call to us not only to follow you, but also ask others to follow you. Father, show me how to pray and speak in such a way that other people's eyes are open. As you did in Jonah's ministry, send your Holy Spirit to convict their hearts so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the grip of Satan to the freedom of God. Your word commands us to go into the world so that the lost may receive the forgiveness of sin they need and claim an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in you. God, use me to reach my family, my neighbors, my city, and beyond so that you will receive glory. Lord God Almighty, touch my heart so that it longs for the salvation of every person in every nation on earth. May your spirit deepen my anguish over those lost in darkness so that I can search them out, love them as you do, and cry out to you for help in bringing them to you. Give me the heart of my Savior, Jesus Christ. May I be faithful to pray for all those your Give me a spiritual burden and tell them about you. Give me a purpose to pray for them on their behalf. Father God, you are always right on time, even when I'm anxious for answers or results. Make me patient after I have sown the seed. Help me to faithfully pray for, listen to, and speak to friends, family members, neighbors, co-workers and others who have not declared you as Savior and Lord of their lives. You have put them in my pathway for a reason, Lord. You found me when I was lost. Send me to find others who need you. Quell any pride and haughtiness in, my, in me that may judge them. Let me see them as co-inheritors of your kingdom. May your kingdom come, Lord to all who, even as we pray those words in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's continue to worship God with our praise music now. You, Are you guys ready? Do you mind if I introduce a couple of my friends I just met? Absolutely. I'd like to have everybody say hi to Zachary and Isaac when they get a minute. And then make sure you tell your name to Zachary, though. He really wants to know your first name. All right. So. Definitely. Let's welcome them. I'm sure this is, uh, by now, it's a familiar praise song. So let's lift up our voices and call upon the Lord to draw us close to him. <clears throat> Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire Nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you Now the ushers will join us for our tithes and offerings. Let's continue to worship God and say, Lord, I come to you. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed. Flowing from the grace that I found in you. 
to know the weaknesses I see.
Lord, we just come to you as we are, knowing that you love us unconditionally. And Lord, we bring ourselves, our tithes and offerings, and we pray, O oh Lord, that through the ministries of this church, through our lives, through our giving, may the world know that Jesus Christ is Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take this time to welcome those who are in our midst for the first time or after a long time. Let's greet one another in the name of Jesus. Right. <laughs> Friends, as we make our way back to our seats, it'll be time for our scripture reading. As you know, we've been reading in the book of Jonah. And <laughs> I need a bell. <laughs> Okay, friends, if you'll stand, please, for our scripture reading. As you know, we've been reading in the book of Jonah, and this week we are reading chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nivea, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nivea according to the word of the Lord. Now Nivea was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, giving a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nivea shall be overthrown. And the people of Nivea believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nivea, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nivea, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And please remain standing for our praise song. Let's stretch our hands as a gesture of receiving and asking God to bless us.
Thank you. Please be seated. So with this, we are in our part three of uh, our sermon series on Jonah, the runaway prophet. And I want to ask you, how's it going so far? We are in part three today about this weird, whether you can call weird Jonah or weird whale who kept Jonah three days and three nights in its belly. Uh, how is it going so far with the book of Jonah? Is it making sense? Is it speaking to us? Yes. We don't do much of uh, the Old Testament I heard from someone uh, that uh, it's been a while since we uh, have studied or had uh, messages from the Old Testament. And I'm glad that we are here. And without the Old Testament, New Testament does not have foundation. Just let me tell you. Those who have become so accustomed uh, to the New Testament and have kind of uh, some kind of prejudice against the Old Testament, uh, we do not have a foundation of the New Testament without the Old Testament. So if you are New Testament people, I think you need to get back uh, to the Word of God. Old and new, both are the Word of God. Amen? Yes. And I, I'm going to give a few more comments on that pretty soon. And as we are in this book of Jonah, many a times what happens, books like Jonah uh, comes under uh, severe scrutiny and uh, secular th uh, theologians or people will begin to say, you know, things are very weird in the Bible. We can't really believe. And that's why we don't really go there. And New Testament, oh, maybe we can, we can see, oh, yeah, 2,000 years ago, yeah, we have some kind of a history uh, which we can believe, um, but Old Testament we don't really know, especially books like Jonah. How could a person uh, stay or live in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, and they will have their criticism against the Bible that this kind of myth over there, and we don't really believe in that. So that's why we don't read Bible. Friends, they haven't done their homework. They haven't really been rigorous students, neither of the word of God nor the history. That's what I want to say to you. Last week, we were looking at the historicity and the authenticity of Jonah itself. If you remember that, if you have missed that message from last week, I want to encourage you to go back uh, on our YouTube channel and listen to part two of uh, the sermon series on Jonah, where we are putting Jonah right in the historical context. And I gave you 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 to 25. And not only the biblical records, but also the secular records will tell you about the kings that are mentioned in the scripture and all the other archaeological uh, references are pointing to the veracity authenticity and validity and reliability of the scripture. That's what I want to encourage you. That the more you know about the authenticity of the scripture, the validity, the reliability of the scripture, better off you are. Amen? So how we move forward from here, as I gave you last week some historical context, and I also showed you some of the things that is in a in museum in the United Kingdom right now. And today I want to bring up our own Lord Jesus Christ, God of the universe, the word of God, who created everything, how he validates the historicity and the literal account of Jonah and its, his ministry. You must have heard from Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus mentions Jonah. Not someone as a, you know, he's trying to give some example and setting up a parable there. No, he's talking about Jonah. Let's listen to Luke 11, 29 to 32, but I'm going to pick, uh, miss a verse here and there, but stay focused so that we don't uh, spend more time here. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign for the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. See the context. Jesus is preaching repentance. Pharisees and Sadducees and all the other religious leaders are there and many 
people are there who are not repenting. Jesus is using the example of Jonah who went to preach repentance. So he's not making up a story and saying, okay, let me just give you a story. He's pointing out Jonah, the authenticity, the historical record, the biblical record of Jonah. Verse 32, he says, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judge judgment with this generation, which simply means if, it was the, if there were no men of Nineveh, if there was not a message of repentance preached, then he cannot refer to the historical event. But Jesus is saying, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with, his, with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. Amen? So what do we see here? If Jesus validates Jonah, not only as a historical figure, but a prophet in the scripture, that settles it. That settles it that this is a historical, authentic record that we have. Amen? Let me just give you a little more. There is archaeological confirmation of a prophet named Jonah whose grave is found in northern Israel. So it's not just simply people are talking about some myth. And I can give you a book's name if you want to make a note. When Critics Ask... And the subtitle is A Popular Handbook on Bible Difficulties by Norman Geisler and Thomas Hoey. They record it. There is an archaeological confirmation of a prophet named Jonah whose grave is found in northern Israel. In addition, some ancient coins have been unearthed with an inscription of a man coming out of a fish's mouth. So you can see how... Uh, these biblical records are being verified even in archaeology. So I just wanted to encourage you, assure you, encourage you that when you go to the Bible, when you go to the scripture, it is not just man-made stories there. We can corroborate that with the historical record, archaeology, and we can see the authentic word of God. We are reading the word of God. Amen? Give me a loud one. Yes, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. When Jesus says he has, he, he is verifying that, that means nobody else has higher authority than God himself. So here we are, when we hold the word of God, when we hold our Bible, we should be confident, we should be assured this is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. Now today we are going to go into the scripture. If you are looking at it, First Sunday, we looked at running away from God. Second Sunday, we looked at running to God. Today, we will be looking at running for God. And on 29th, after my business trip, uh, when I return, on 29th, we will be on running with God. So we'll wrap up this sermon series. And as we have seen in the last couple of weeks, what was going on, why Jonah was running away from God. You know, we looked uh, under the hood or psychological makeup of Jonah, why he was running away from God, his emotional state, and all those things we looked at last week. So today, uh, we will be focusing on what made him to run for God now. When I say run for God, means God wanted to reach out to the Ninevites, right? But he was looking for Jonah to go. So Jonah is running for God. God. And God calls you and me also to run for him to complete his mission. And I want to say to you that he's running for God. He needs to run with God, which is the fourth Sunday which we will be looking at. There's a difference between running for God and running with God. And we will explore that on uh, when we have next time a, a, a sermon on this sermon series. So stay tuned. So running for God the reason I'm, I have differentiated between running for God and running with God because he hasn't resolved some deep-seated issues with God. That's what we were looking at last week. You know, he has some kind of um, arguments against God. He is not happy with the way God works. So he, have, he has some deep-seated issues going on in his life. When we have deep-seated issues going on in our lives, 
and we can rationalize that, justify that, and keep moving in the direction God doesn't want us to go. And many Christians do that. They know the word of God tells us this, but we have our own arguments going on, and we do not really understand who God is, how he works, and his ways as he revealed himself to us. So we take a different route. We say we are still with God, we still believe in God. If you remember that, last week we, I said it's not about your faith whether you believe in God or not. It's about whether you are hearing and doing what God is calling you to do. That was last week. So today, somehow we know that Jonah has come back on track, running for God. But what does it mean? Uh, we will try to understand that. But for those who have just joined us, I just wanted to show you that how far Jonah tried to run away from God. He was supposed to go about 550 miles northeast of Samaria, but then he was planning on going from 2,500 miles away to Tarshish. So that was his plan when God caught up with him, so to speak. So what we are going to do today, I am going to give you an outline so you can track, you know where we are going. So I'm not going to take you on a journey where you don't know where we are and when this message will end and we don't know what's going on. So just 10 verses and then there is an outline, God's message, his command, then we have verse 3, Jonah's obedience, then a message proclaimed, and then Nineveh repented, God relented. So we are going to focus on these five points today, and this will help us to make notes, if you are making notes, and this will also help us to uh, track with Jonah and track with God and hear God's voice. So the first thing we see here, God's message is coming. Let's read together. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Let's pause there. Did you notice that God is writing the script all over again? He started in chapter 1, verse 1, go. And what did Jonah do? He did go, but he went in the opposite direction. And he, it was an intentional disobedience because he knew where God was sending him. First thing, when, as we hear there, as we see is this, that God's message doesn't change. He doesn't shift. We may shift. We may change our opinions. But God remains God. Amen? And I think that we must know. Why we need to know that? So that we cannot manipulate God. We should know that. We cannot manipulate, we cannot change simply God's mind because of our bad attitude, because of our disobedience, because of what we want to do. God is God. He knows what he is doing. Amen? I think that, that tells us that we can trust in God's character. That is very important. You know, if God starts to shift, we lose the point of reference. If God starts to shift, we lose the point of reference. Now, why is it important to have a point of reference? That is very important. So that we know where to look when things start to move. How many of you have been uh, uh, on the a crossroad or on a signal when there is a red light and suddenly a car next to you is moving and you're thinking that you are moving and going to run the red light. How many of you have experienced that? Even on the, in the parking lot, right? You just parked and you, suddenly you thought maybe you're going to hit someone because you're moving. But you were not moving. Somebody else was moving. But what do you look for at that time when things are moving and you are not sure? You look for a point of reference, right? You look for a point of reference. And what do you do? When cars are moving, you are not sure. You look for buildings. At least buildings are not going to move. You look for something that is not moving. That becomes your point of reference. So the very first thing that we see here from Jonah, oh, my goodness. The word of God, if you start digging deeper, is powerful. It's, it's just going to help us more and more. The more we know God, the more confident we become. And it's very important for us. If your children are going to shake parents, the parents can never discipline their children, I tell you. 
Why? Because they can manipulate, they can change things. And sometimes we as children, we think that God is like our father and mother whom we could manipulate. Many children do that. Even now we are adults, we do that. We manipulate in our relationships. And people, those who are weak, they are shaken, they move, and we get our own way done. We get through our own way. But with God, we have one good thing, that God is not going to be manipulated. God's character is good. He's solid. He's reliable. And it is good that he doesn't move and shake and change. Goodness should not be changed. So the first thing we see that God's word tells us his message did not change. God's word is reliable. So second time God comes to Jonah, the same message. Nothing has changed. Same message, and God's heart is the same heart. God, what do we see here? God is the God of second chances. How many of you have received second chance from God? Many of us have received so many chances from God, and yet we are not turning to God. But God, it's a way of speaking, God is a God of second chances. It, basically, God is a God of so many chances. He's really waiting for you. Don't mess up your life. Don't mess your life up. I'm waiting for you. Jonah was just running and messing up. He was just in trouble and getting other people in trouble because of his disobedience. But God's message has not changed. God is compassionate towards Jonah because God knows Jonah. Amen? God knows each and every one of us. And he, he is patient with us. He's compassionate towards us. All he wants us to turn to him. God's compassion is for Ninevites too. So that's what we see here. Even though Jonah has to come back, God's message hasn't changed. God's compassion hasn't changed. What a wonderful God we have. That God is a God of second chances. We can all rest assured that we have a good, good God. Amen? Yeah, we should be just happy and run to God instead of running away from God. So God's command comes, number one, that's what we see. The second thing I see here, there is a drastic change in Jonah's response. When second time God's word came, let's read verse 3, what does verse 3 says? Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city, it took three days to go through it. What happened? Why a drastic change in Jonah's life? Why Jonah turned to God, I would say, and this is the theme that I want to trace today, one of the important themes, that Jonah realized more about God. As I made a first point here, that we cannot change or shift God's opinions, right? Because of our disobedience. So what is happening here? Jonah learned the lesson, there is no way that I should be running away from God, right? I have a better understanding of God that I can run, but I cannot hide. Now I have a better understanding of who my God is. Even though I go very far, he's going to pull me back and ask me to do the same thing. So some of us will be sitting here, after five years, God is going to ask you the same thing. Many people take shortcut. Many people try to just go around the things, and they think that, oh, I'm okay now. But I tell you, if you have not learned, if I have not learned the lesson God wants to teach us, it's going to hit you after five years too. Amen? That's the goodness of God. Because God has great plan and purpose in and through your life. He's working with you. So the best thing is, let's get on track. That's what Jonah realized, that even if I run away, he's going to drag me back. So what's the point? So this time, Jonah had a better understanding. Before he thought, if I just go away, God probably would say, send someone else. I'm sitting somewhere else, right? But God doesn't seem to change. So what happened? Three things happened. Num number one, and this is how things happen with us. His misunderstanding about God was leading him to 
have some kind of misconception about God. Misunderstanding about the character of God led to have misconception about God. And that misconception led to his disobedience. That's what happens, friends. That's what happens. When we do not understand who God is, we develop our own picture of God. Misconception of God. And then what happens? Then we go into disobedience, not really realizing that we are disobedient because we have a good, rational way of explaining what I'm doing, why I'm doing. And I say, and I, we also have a story behind that. God must be understanding me and God will be supporting my view and point of view and opinion. That's what we say. In other words, we try to vote on God's stated will sometimes. And we say, majority voted for this opinion. So that it, it means we are okay. Why? Because the majority voted. But on the other hand, if God says no, that means no, no matter how many worldly thinkers, majority of the people, denominations will go this way. If God said that is not my way, that is not God's way. Amen? That's what is going on here. So what happens? I'm, I'm going to give you another example so that you can better understand this point. Why? Because Jonah, when he understood who God is, his understanding, his conception of God changed. His picture of God changed. That's why he became obedient. Let me just show you this picture. How many of you know what is this? Golden calf from Exodus 32. Now we all know that when God delivered Israel from the land of slavery in Egypt, right? They were on the way to the promised land. And when Moses went to talk with God, what happened? 40 days, Moses is not around. The Israelite pressured Aaron and told him, make a God for us. What did, the, what did they say? Make a God for us. We don't know what happened to Moses. Make a God for us so that we can brag about that God who delivered us from Egypt. Make a God for us. What kind of God Aaron came up with? The golden calf. Now, where would that golden calf will come from? That is coming because all 400 years, Israelites experienced all the idol worships around them. Are you following what I'm saying? In all their imagination, they did not have the experience of the living God. So all that picture they had developed about God, that was playing out. The culture had influenced them. When you are influenced by the culture, when you are influenced by your preconceived ideas and opinions, you have a different picture of God. And based on that picture, what happens? You act or enact. Did you understand these three points? The character of God, the picture of God, and human action. What do we know about the character of God? One, that God is not an idol. He is a living God. You cannot form him into idol, so you cannot have this kind of thing. Third, you were supposed to honor God, not by idol worship, by worshiping the living God. When Moses comes, he breaks the golden calf into pieces, even fine powder. Why? That is not God. He corrects their distorted image of God. He corrects their character of God. Amen? So that they can go in obedience. Similarly, we can think about other characters that we find in the scripture. Think about Thomas. When Thomas said that I cannot believe that Jesus rose again because he could not believe in the character of God that God could ri raise Jesus up, right? That's why his understanding, his lack of understanding about God led him to think that is, must be some ghost, not a real thing. Third, led him to misbelief and disobey in, the, in believing that Jesus Christ has risen. risen. When Jesus comes... When he shows himself alive, Thomas changed. He had a new revelation of God, and then he said, my Lord and my God. 
And that's the point I'm making. When Apostle Paul goes around persecuting the church, he thought that he was doing the right thing. Do you remember that? He thought he was doing the right thing because he did not know the character of God. What kind of God is this? Who is this God? He did not have a complete knowledge of the triune God. In other words, God the Son. When Jesus reveals himself to him on the road to Damascus, his perception, his conception, everything changed. He turned away from persecuting the church to planting the church, spreading the good news of Jesus. These three things were happening there too. When you do not have the right knowledge of God, you have the wrong understanding of God and misconception of God that leads you to disobedience. That's what was going on. Let me just uh, move on to the next point. I had a couple more points under this, but I hope I made my point clear. Amen? Why would Jonah this time obey God because Jonah has a better understanding of God. What does it mean? It means the more we know about God, the better we know how to live our lives. Many people, those who do not read the Bible, don't go to the uh, uh, scripture studying, I can guarantee you they do not have the right picture of God. They have some distorted, reducted image of God. So I want to challenge you to start digging yourself deeper in the word of God. If you're not, then possibility, high possibility, I guarantee you, you will develop your own image of God, your own kind of character of God, and that will lead you into disobedience and further away from God, not closer to God. Does it make sense? Amen? That's what Jonah, Jonah's story is telling us. So friends, our encounter with God in the word of God, in the character of God, transforms us to do what God wants us to do. What is happening next? Jonah obeyed. Message was proclaimed. And what happened when message was proclaimed? Surprisingly, all these people repented. This was not Jonah's magic. It was the power of of the word of God. And that tells us that message must be preached. Many liberal theologians have started saying the mission is eradicate poverty. That is the whole mission of the church. What a sad thing that mission has only become about the poor. Rich people don't need Jesus. What a sad thing that liberal theologians, missiologists have lost the picture as if only the poor people need to be lifted out of poverty, but they don't need the gospel. Rich people don't need the gospel at all. That is bad theology. Everyone needs gospel. Did you notice the king of that nation repented? He needed the gospel. Whether you are rich, you are poor. Everyone needs the gospel, and gospel must be preached. If you do not preach the gospel, I don't know what you're talking about when you are following Jesus Christ, because he came to give us the good news, and many people need that good news. People repent or not, that is up to them, but we have the good news. Message must be proclaimed. It doesn't mean that we should not care for the poor and needy. We must care for the poor and needy. But that is, could be part of the mission, but that is not the mission. The mission is to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Along with that, that should be our lifestyle to care for the needy, care for the poor, do the social justice. That should be our lifestyle that is not just the mission. If that is the mission of the church, then there is no difference between NGO and the church. And we are not NGOs. Amen? We are God's church with responsibility, greater responsibility than the NGOs. We should do all that the NGOs are doing as our lifestyle. But we have a greater mission to proclaim. 
so that people will find hope. Nineveh needed so that they could be spared from the wrath. They could be spared from running in their own evil practices. What would have happened if Hamas would repent? Can you believe? I have heard stories of terrorists, gangsters, who lived ugly lives, despicable lives, life that was just completely wicked and evil. And when they came to Christ, those murderers, robbers, wicked people, when they turned to Christ, not only their lives changed, society changed. People were not afraid of them. People were running to them. That is the power. That's the power of the gospel. That's why I said the third point, message must be proclaimed. Message was proclaimed by Jonah. What happened? Nineveh repented. And then what happened? God relented. God cares for everyone. Why would God send Jonah to Nineveh? A foreign nation. Because for God there is no domestic or foreign. Everything belongs to God. Amen. God is the God of all. And his heart is beating for all. We need to pray. Not only for the Israel. We need to pray for Palestinians. You know sometimes we get so blinded. I caught myself so blinded. Because I'm so upset and so upset and angry at Hamas. And I'm praying for Israel. God had to correct me and say, pray for the Palestinians too. Amen. We need to pray for them. They're caught between the crossfire. They're innocent. I'm not changing any foreign policy right here. But I'm changing our hearts so that we can start praying. Why? Because all these leaders will have their own agenda but God has only one agenda is to care for everyone he loves the Palestinians the Arabs everyone his heart beats for them his heart beats for Israel so friends today if you have become so pro-Israel you become pro-people of this world it doesn't mean that we are not standing with Israel. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying that we can become so blinded, we forget God. And we become guards. If God could send Jonah to this wicked nation, chapter 1 verse 1 clearly says this is a wicked nation. And I'm sending Jonah. So God's message, first of all, is not the message of judgment. He's the, he has the message of compassion and repentance. That people will repent. God will relent. But if people don't repent, God must hold wickedness accountable. God must hold wickedness accountable. Because if God does not hold wickedness, wickedness accountable, then he is not God. Righteous God has to be just. Amen. So he must hold wickedness accountable. But he is also a merciful God. Those who repent, he will relent. So let us now come to God. Think about what kind of picture do we have about God? Why are we not running for God? I'm reading through all those uh, papers that you gave me. Remember the sheets, green sheets, or the white sheets on the first Sunday? I'm going through everything. I, I'm just kind of analyzing, just trying to understand what you're writing as, the, as your dream for the kingdom. Now, I'm not going to make any comments here, but what I'm realizing more and more is that less and less people are running for God to reach out to others. That's what my observation is. The church is running to church, running to other believers, but not running with the gospel to Non-believers, de-churched and unchurched, they need to repent. They need to turn to God. They need to experience the goodness of God. Amen? So let's do that. 
we had a wonderful prayer, thank you, Alice, today, that we need to go beyond ourselves. That is Jonah, because God is going beyond Jonah. Let us close our eyes, let us look into our hearts, and let us rise in the presence of God. And repent from anything that is not of God, as we heard from the word of God today. And commit yourself to read more and more the word of God. Don't talk about your strong faith. I, Dad, I don't really need to read Bible. I know who Jesus is. You will be blindsided many a time, many times. And just blinded. You go to the word of God, the only source of knowing the character of God, the heart of God. And commit yourself to grow in the Lord. And ask God, Lord, where do you want me to go? Whom do you want me to reach out? Correct my views. Give me your heart. Help me to obey. That's the only way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn and let's close. Now receive the benediction. Now may the love of God the Father, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and sweet companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go and preach the good news of Jesus to all 
that need Jesus. Go now. Amen.